everyone, and welcome to Studio Jake. I, of course, am your host, Jacob Airy. Thank you for joining me today. Also, be sure to like this video, subscribe, and then head over to Studio Jake Faith. That's my new channel where I talk about all things Christianity. I do apologetics, devotionals, discuss theology, react to certain things, and it's a lot of fun. So head over there. I'm trying it out. I hope you enjoy it. For now, I also want to talk to you one more plug here. Um... I've got a fantasy series, and if you're like, hey, Jacob, I thought you were going to talk about Rings of Power. I certainly am. And if you aren't liking the way fantasy adaptions are going these days with The Wheel of Time or Rings of Power, definitely check out my fantasy series, The Seven Royals. It starts off with The Seven Royals, All Good Things, and then it continues with The Seven Royals, Breaking the Stars, and the third one is being worked on as we speak. So definitely check it out. And you can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or BookLocker.com. All right, so on to episode three of The Rings of Power. And, you know, of course, it's this uh, very bland adaption of the appendices section of The Lord of the Rings, which takes place in the Second Age. I reviewed the first episode. You can definitely uh, check that out. It's... Uh, I think I brought my objections pretty clearly. So I'm going to start out with a, an episode summary, and there will be spoilers during the, episodes, um, during the episode summary. So here is your spoiler warning. Um, excuse me for not having, because I know a lot of these movie reviewers, they'll have like uh, scenes from it rolling and stuff. I'm a small channel and YouTube likes to pick on small channels or they allow corporate overlords to do so. So I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to talk about it. So episode um, episode three starts off in the Southlands. We see Arendir, who is the elf um, from the first two episodes. He's the one who's in love with a, with a human single mom, I guess. And he was being he was captured by the elves in, at, uh, in the previous installments. So we see him and he's with other elves who have been captured by the orcs and they're being forced to dig and he's not really sure what for. Neither do the other elves and the other elves they want to try to escape. So they tell him when he um, he's kind of like curious what's going on. Uh, we see Galadriel. She wakes up with uh, her human companion, Halbrand. They're on a Numenor ship, a vessel of that human kingdom. Um, she meets the captain, um, and uh, he has her brother's knife on his. For some reason, that's important. He has that on his person. Um, they arrive in Numenor, and everyone is kind of like shocked to see an elf. Oh my gosh, an elf? So, this isn't a fantasy world, is it? So anyway, she meets the Queen Regent, who is Muriel, and they have like this weird standoff where they're kind of like insulting each other vaguely. Uh, Gladriel makes a comment that is ridiculous, saying, oh, um, the elves gave you Numenor, and the Queen is like, no, we were, or excuse me, Queen Regent, is like, no, we worked for it. And they have like this really weird standoff, and Halibrand, he notices that like, um, some of the Queen's guards are starting to surround them while they're talking to her. So he kind of offers a compromise and saying, hey, let's just stay here for three days. Because um, Muriel, for some reason, doesn't want to send Gladriel back to Middle-earth. I don't know why. Uh, it's kind of weird. But anyway, so it's clear that uh, Numenor has kind of become like isolationist, I guess. Um, we discover that the captain is uh, Isalindi, who uh, who is one of the great kings of men and in Lord of the Rings, you know, he's in the intro um, to the Fellowship of the Ring during the ba final battle with Sauron. Um, and uh, we find out that his son is joining the Navy. They have the sequence with uh, his son, who is a sealed door, of course, and he's the one who cut the ring off Sauron's hand in Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring. They haven't, they're not showing this, obviously. And for some reason, he has a sister. I don't know why she's a thing because she doesn't really have a big appearance and she wants to join a guild or something it's <laughs> anyway so mary muriel she kind of dresses down elindy for rescuing gladriel how dare you bring an elf onto the island and all this stuff and so uh it turns out elindy's surname means friend of elf or something like that and so she's like I, and she implies that she thinks she's he's a traitor or something ridiculous like that so back in the um, southlands Arendir, he and the other elves are planning to um escape and 
when he asks kind of like, hey, what, what's going on here? Like, uh, you know, and he gets a little bit more, um, a little bit more information. It seems like the other elves, the orcs are following someone. They don't know who. And it's sort of implied that it might be uh, Sauron. Um, and uh, they're saying, uh, and so they're kind of worried and they're planning to escape. Speaking of escape, Gladriel, because she's uh, brave, bold, beautiful, smart, and all the other things in between, she somehow escapes from the confines. She had been kind of confined to the palace. I don't know why that was a big deal to her, but she manages to escape. But Elindy, um, fi but Elindy stops her and basically says, hey, listen, the queen put me in charge of you. Why don't you come back to, to my side of the island? It's a kind of a smaller uh, kingdom there. And so that way, um, and then later, we'll, I'll take you home. I'll, I'll find you a, a boat and we'll go home. So um, we see Halibran. He's, um, he's like trying to get a job as a smith, but in Numenor, I guess because it's a thing now, they have to ha have this special like badge. So then he like buys people, drinks at a bar, and tries to swipe this guy's badge while he's there. Um, so Elindy is still talking with Galadriel, and uh, he tells her that the last king wanted to restore relationships to the elves. Apparently Numenor and the elfish kingdoms haven't been speaking since um, uh, Muriel's great-grandfather or something like that. And so, uh, he, uh, so he's like showing her his library, and she figures out that, because remember in the first two episodes, she had been finding this symbol. She was calling it a sigil because we have to say that instead of symbol. And she thought it was Sauron's like calling card, but then she realizes it looks exactly like a map of the Southlands. And so um, she kind of deduces, because again, she's brave, beautiful, wonderful, and all these things, that uh, Sauron wants to conquer it. So then it cuts to the Harfoots for some reason, and they're about, they're having a party, they're about to migrate again, and the kid who's working with the Meteor Man, she steals a map and shows it to him. Um, when he tries to like see it in the light, it, he accidentally causes a ruckus. Uh, and so the Harfoot council are all kind of mad but they really don't do anything about it other than they they tell the girl's family that they might have to um that they might have to be left behind but then they decide not to it's a whole thing so then uh in Numenor is Elindy and Isildur kind of have an argument because Isildur he doesn't really want to be uh the captain of a ship like Elindy is and they have like this weird argument about it okay great so Galadriel speaks to Halibrand and reveals that she has deduced, because again, she's brave, beautiful, wonderful, and everything in between, that um, he's actually the king of the Southland and he's been overthrown because of the orc attacks and everything. And he, he's worried because his uh, ancestors sided with Morgoth in the first um, age. And so he's kind of like, listen, I, I'm kind of worried I'm not a hero and all this stuff and somehow she convinces him because she's brave beautiful and wonderful and everything in between um muriel speaks to a mysterious person who you don't see and says the elf is here <laughs> oh, 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 ominous so then it cuts back to the harfoots the meteor man is helping them move along um so then we go back to the uh, uh back to the southlands and arendir and the other elves are trying to escape um, they uh, try to take advantage of the daylight to confuse the orcs. Uh, so the orcs release a warg and uh, it fails. They actually all, two of them get, or actually more than two actually, I think uh, several of them get killed. Arendir gets recaptured and uh, that's pretty much how the episode ends. Um, other than the orcs say we're going to take him to our leader and that's it. So, um, okay, so about the episode itself, what happened in this episode? Absolutely nothing happened. Uh, nothing. Nothing happens in this episode. Nothing was done uh, to move the story forward. We're not in a, we're not re the dwarfs and what um, they're doing is not brought in. Elrond trying to convince the other elves to let the dwarves build a mighty forge. All that is thrown aside. Um, the urgency of seeing the meteor man come down. That's all but forgotten. It was such a big buildup, and then it was kind of just you know, went away in the wind. 
Um, no consistency there. We just get to see... Gla and Now, and keep in mind, this episode was 70 minutes. Like, I get the pilot being an hour long, and maybe even the second episode being an hour long, because they were released back to back. Um, they were actually supposed to be released on Friday, uh, on uh, Friday, September 2nd, but they moved it back when the fans were pointing out, hey, that's, that's Jero Tolkien's death. That's the day of his death. So they moved it up a day because they realized how bad it looked. And personally, I think they did it on purpose. They didn't think people would notice. But of course, we the fans of Middle Earth, we actually know our stuff. So we called them out for it. And fortunately, that at least changed. Now, the whole scene with Muriel and Gladriel having this face-off where it's kind of like a pissing contest, it was silly. It was dumb. It looked catty. I know they were like, oh, these two brave and bold and beautiful women are, are having like this like this standoff. And oh my gosh. Oh, 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 slay queens. But, but okay, it looks silly. They just look like, they look ridiculous. They looked as ridiculous as when Iron Man and Captain America were kind of having that standoff where Captain America's like, big man in a suit of armor. Without your armor, what, out, what are you? And Tony's like, genius philanthropist and he says something else i can't remember um but uh it, it, it's kind of interesting that uh, the whole point of the avengers was that scene was with the two of them having that face off it was supposed to show just the difference between captain america and iron man you know captain america seen as the selfless hero iron man seemed kind of like a a hero for the thrill of it and but there was not that there at, in muriel and gladriel if anything, it made them both look bad. It made them both look worse. And, you know, they already messed up Muriel. She's not the queen regent. She's the princess of Numenor. So I don't know what they're doing. Now, it, it, what ends up happening, spoiler alert, I don't think the series is going to do this because the writing's been terrible. But what, what happens in Numenor is there's a civil war between the people who want to abandon the Valar and then the people who are the friends. And uh, they're called the faithful, I think, in the books. And that's kind of, and then the, the, the ones who are against the faithful, they actually try to go to the Undying Lands, and only elves and wizards are permitted in the Undying Lands. So the Valar send a great storm, and that's what destroys Numenor. However, they give the faithful time to escape, and the faithful, of course, go on to be the great kings of men, and they f found the kingdoms of Gondor and Rohan, and so on and so forth. And... Uh, but Muriel, it, Muriel's character was not the queen regent. She was a princess of Numenor. And I just think, it, and they're making it where it seems like she would be against the faithful. And because uh, Elindi and Isildur, their family seems to be for, you know, wanting to restore relationships with the elves. And in fact, they make a reference, I mentioned this earlier, that the king that Elindi served he wanted to restore relationships with the elves, but then Muriel and her people ousted him. So, you know, it, that could have been something that could have been shown, but because they're not, because the writers don't know what they're doing, they just made it look like a scene that was kind of worthless. And not to put too fine a point on it, Isildur does not have a sister. Why is this a thing? You know, I, I honestly feel like, okay, so you're going to change Gladriel and make her into this, you know, this third wave feminist in Middle Earth for some reason. You're going to change Muriel where she's no longer a princess. So you want to have a, a character that is, in, in, that is, you know, maybe embodies, you know, the, the, the attributes of the beauty and grace and wisdom that they're removing from those characters but no she just was kind of a throwaway character i don't even know why she was there and um you know and also this family drama where isildur and alindi are going back and forth about um isildur's career like what is, again this isn't modern times this is middle freaking earth it's a fantasy world why are we having family drama that you would see in a sitcom in this thing that's supposed to be like this big spanning epic about the second age of middle earth now ironically the uh, holobrand is the best character and he's made up for the show but that's because 
the writers, because, um, and you know, it's kind of funny because the writers, they box themselves in by changing the characters that are there. So Elrond is kind of a beta male, uh, Galadriel, she's no longer wise and graceful and beautiful and strategic. Um, she's now bossy and annoying, and uh, more on that later. But, so their their best characters are actually Arendir and Holobrand, the original characters. Now back to the Harfoots. They have the best scenes in the whole show. The problem is they add nothing to the plot. There is nothing going on with them. They in no way, shape, or form connection. Well, Draco, but you only the third episode. Maybe they'll come along later in the season. No, this isn't some... Uh, this isn't supposed to be this way. Everything is supposed to connect. We need to see why the Heartfoots are important now. Well, Jacob, what about the Meteor Man? The Meteor Man came down. The Meteor Man is so isolated. They could literally have given all of his scenes to the people of the Southlands, to the elves, or to Numenor. They could have easily had to... Heck, even the dwarves would have mattered more. The, you know, this connection with the Heartfoots, which again, Heartfoots didn't exist in the Second Age. They're not an early version of the Hobbits. They are a tribe of the Hobbits. It's absolutely uh, ridiculous that the writers are so creatively bankrupt. They could not understand this. Now, on a technical note, uh, a lot, I've seen a lot of reviewers um, say, oh, I don't like the sets or the scenery or the music. I humbly disagree with that. I actually think the sets do look impressive. I think the music looks, it sounds really great. Um, I, I think that uh, even the, the spanning cinematography, that's, that's good. So those are the three things it has going for it. But again, on a technical note, one thing that my super cute wife points out is that all the clothes look like they just came from Nordstrom's. With, with Lord of the Rings trilogy and even the Hobbit trilogy, we, we got to see that there was wear and tear on what people were wearing, that this was, their clothes were a part of their lives, that, you know, they were warriors or, um, or farmers or, or whatever their status was on Middle Earth. We saw how it impacted it down into their clothing. This looks like, um, these outfits look like uh, um, even when Gladriel is found by um, Elindy and she's brought up, she's wearing like these weird pajama things. They still look like they just came off the shelf at some fancy department store. So I don't know why they were doing that. Now, uh, the warg attack on the, uh, on the elves, the warg looked like it was a bad video game. Like that was some bad CGI. Uh, I don't, you know, I expect more from Hollywood, especially since the Transformers and, uh, and heck, the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, you expect more for, from this, especially something that's supposed to be as spanning as this. And nope, not at all. Also, one, one minor note about it is the audio is terrible. The music is loud and obnoxious, as are the special effects. It's kind of annoying because it overbears... Uh, it's overbearing, and sometimes it overtakes the uh, the dialogue, and you can barely hear. I, I remember in episode two, we actually had to turn on the subtitles because the special effects and the music was overtaking it so much. So they need to do something about this. Now, on another note, there was something that that happened on social media, and I don't know why Amazon continues to um, uh, to double down on this. So. They released this statement, and it's like this pathetic statement about, oh, the criticism is just, uh, uh, the criticism is just all these uh, racist people, and they actually use the word racism in their statement. Here, I'll just read it to you because I don't want I don't want anyone to accuse me of, uh, you know, misspeaking. We, the cast of Rings of Power, stand together in absolute solidarity and against the relentless racism, threats, harassment, and abuse of our castmates of color that are, uh, are, are being subjected to on a daily, daily basis. We refuse to ignore it or tolerate it. J.R. Tolkien created a world which by definition is multicultural, so show that world! A world in which free peoples from different races and cultures join together in fellowship to defeat the forces of evil. So show it! Rings of Power def uh, reflects that our uh, reflects that our world. No, it doesn't. Our world has never been all white. Fantasy has never been all white. Middle world Earth is not all white. BIPOC belong in Middle Earth, and they are here to stay. No one's disputing that. Finally, 
Our love and fellowship goat are out to the fans supporting us, especially fans of Kalar, spelled in the British way because we're trying to be fancy, who are themselves being attacked simply for existing in this fandom. Again, not happening, they're attacking us. We see your brave we see you, your bravely, and endless creativity. There's been zero creativity. Your cosplays, fan cams, fan art, and insights make this community a richer place and remind us of our purpose. You are valid, you are loved, and you belong. You are an integral part of the Lord of, of the L O T R family. This isn't Lord of the Rings. Thanks for having our back. And then they have some elvish thing. So this is ridiculous and silly and pathetic of them. So I replied, fans having problems with changes to something we love is not hate or racism. It is not our job to give you, Amazon, the benefit of the doubt. You are supposed to show us why we should like it. You and the cast failed. Sorry, not sorry. And that's okay. It is not on us just to like it because they slap Middle Earth or Lord of the Rings or Tolkien on it. That is not, we are just not supposed to like it. We don't have to like it and we are allowed to bring thoughtful criticism and complaints, quite frankly, and it doesn't matter how they do it. All they're doing is creating more tension between the fans and the show. And you're gonna see more pushback because of their little wine fest, their little struggle se sessions and creating a safe space. Oh my gosh, it's pathetic. Lord of the Rings deserves better, Tolkien deserves better, and the real fans of Lord of the Rings deserve better than this pathetic rings of power and the pandering that Amazon Studios is doing to people who I guarantee you did not even watch the Peter Jackson trilogy. If you liked that video, please leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. Give it a thumbs up. And I would be honored today if you would subscribe. No matter what platform you're watching on, please subscribe. Hit that follow button. Share it out all over the place. And check me out on some of my other socials. I've got links in the, in the description below. Also, check out my website, studiojakemedia.com, and consider supporting this channel on studiojakemedia.locals. Dot com. It really helps uh, smaller creators out. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you next time right here on Studio Jake.